Levine, AERA Executive Director, Felice Levine. Well, what a thrill. Welcome, one and all. Uh, I'm Felice Levine, Executive Director of the American Educational Research Association. And on behalf of ARA, I am thrilled to open the 20th Annual Brown Lecture in Education Research. <laughs> Quite a number. To those joining virtually across the country and around the world, welcome as well. For those unfamiliar with AERA, the American Educational Research Association, over 100 years old, was founded in 1916 and is the nat largest national and international scientific and scholarly society dedicated to advancing knowledge about education, to encouraging scholarly inquiry related to education, and to promoting the use of research to improve education and serve the public good. We stand committed to the critical importance of education and the role of research in making education a powerful and effective force of good in the lives of individuals from all backgrounds and for all societies. This commitment is central to why we are here today and what we will learn and discuss together. This year's Brown Lecture is the first to be delivered to a public audience, which is part of the thrill, at the Ronald Reagan Building since 2019. After holding the Brown Lecture in mostly virtual settings and space due to COVID, we are really excited to be back and to convene a, play, a place based event with a live audience and to be able to simultaneously web stream to thousands more. We are at a complex time for our nation and for our world. From the Supreme Court decisions of the last term to actions and activities of states and local school boards, we are witnessing a renewed verve that is eroding a commitment to equity and justice, politicizing education, and challenging trust in so many institutions of society, including science and research. These issues are central to the Brown Lecture, as you will soon learn this evening. I want first to also acknowledge the generous support of the 25 supporters and friends of the lecture. Without them tonight, this event would not have been possible. Because of the number of supporters and friends, I will not read them all, they're behind me, but we thank them um, really uh, extremely for their long-term commitment to the Brown Lecture. Thank you, thank you for your commitment to this important event. I would also like to thank, thank the Brown Lecture Committee, Selection Committee, chaired by Dr. Jamel Donner for its hard work and exceptional choice for the 2023 Brown Lecture. Now, as a special treat, I would like to welcome to the stage Dr. Dawn Williams, Dean of the School of Education at Howard University, one of our nearest and dearest in DC. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much, Felice, for this opportunity to allow me to address the audience. This year, you could not have had a better lecturer choice other than Dr. Leslie Fenwick. She is certainly a scholar of Brown, and how much do we need to know about the impacts of Supreme Court rulings? We are all closely watching. So while we are here gathered for this, this annual event at AERA, I wanted you all also to to know it is Howard University's homecoming week. <laughs> yeah. 
The third day of homecoming is traditionally when the School of Education faculty, students, staff, and alumni gather. So we decided this year we will not have that because we will hold court here at the Brown Lecture <laughs> to support Dr. Leslie Fenwick. I also like to acknowledge one of the past presidents of Howard University, H. Patrick Swigert, if you could stand. <laughs> <clears throat> With this much intelligence in the room, there is always a bison in the house. So I'm going to say HU. You and can the HU community please stand? Mm -hmm. We certainly appreciate the love and this, we could not have asked for a better moment to kick off our homecoming celebrations. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I am really pleased now to introduce ARA President Tyrone C. Howard, who is a valued colleague a tremendous leader and a highly respected scholar in his own right. Dr. Howard is professor of education in the School of Education and Information Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. In addition to being the Pritzker Family Endowed Chair, Dr. Howard is the director of the UCLA Pritzker Center for Strengthening Children and Families. Can't think of any more important an aspiration at this point in time. And director of the UCLA Center for the Transformation of Schools. Tyrone, the podium is yours. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. Come on, they told me HU was in the house. Good evening, everybody. Where y'all at? All right, there we go. Uh, it is my uh, sincere honor, privilege uh, to be here with you all this evening. I want to thank you, Felice, and thank you to everyone uh, joining us this evening for the 20th annual Brown Lecture, including those attending in person, as well as the thousands more across the country, around the world, joining us on the live stream. I wish to acknowledge that tonight's event in Washington, D.C. is being held on the homeland of indigenous peoples on Piscataway land. I ask that you join me in recognizing the indigenous people on whose land we stand. Thank you. In 2004, AERA inaugurated the Brown Lecture to not only commemorate the U.S. Supreme Court's landmark decision in Brown versus Board of Education, ending racial segregation in public schools, but also to acknowledge the social scientists who at the time brought innovative ideas and research methods to efforts to understand the many ways in which inequities present themselves in our society. The Brown Lecture is a powerful reminder annually of the central role that research can and should play in advancing equality in education across racial and ethnic groups, countries of origin, economic classes, languages, gender and sexual identities, and other areas that diversify our society. Each year, we select our speaker, a, pre a preeminent scholar, whose work has contributed substantially to the fight for justice and equity in education. During a troubling time for our country when court decisions, the actions of state governors and legislatures, and the loud voices of a vocal minority in school districts across the country are pushing back against the progress of brown and diversity and inclusion, we are fortunate for the work and insight of our 2023 Brown Lecture speaker, Dr. Leslie T. Fenwick. Can we show her some love, folks? Before she comes out, though, let me tell you who we have in our presence, why we are honored to be able to have her as our Brown Lecturer. Dr. Leslie T. Fenwick is a professor of educational policy and dean emerita at Howard University. Let me say it again, at Howard University. <laughs> a third time, Howard University. Come on, folks, show us some love. There we go, okay. And is dean in residence at the American Association for Colleges of Teacher Education. She is widely recognized for her expertise in public policy, educational equity, and leadership. A lifelong educator who has worked in every sector of education, Dr. Fenwick is known as a fearless voice for educational equity. In 2022, she was appointed by U.S. President Joe Biden to the Board of Visitors for the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, where she has served as a senior vice fellow since 2017. 
and occasionally lectures about the character leaderships and ethics. A former visiting scholar and visiting fellow at Howard University, Dr. Fenwick is the author of the award-winning book, Jim Crow's Pink Slip. That's right. If you haven't read it, you need to read it. It is a powerful historical impact that I think is so fitting for our conversation this evening. Her widely disseminated policy research, monographs, and op-ed articles have been cited and published by the American Association for Colleges of Teacher Education, the National Academy of Education, Brookings Institute, the Center for American Progress, Southern Education Foundation, Harvard College, New York Times, Washington Post, Boston Globe, y'all get it, right? It goes on and on and on, right? And Politico. Uh, Dr. Fenwick is a director appointed member of the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. If, come on now, come on now, y'all know where you're at, right? In 2013, she was selected as the W.E.B. Du Bois Distinguished Lecturer for the AERA Research Focus on Black Education Special Interest Group. And in 2011, she was awarded the W.E.B. Du Bois Award for Leadership in Higher Education by the National Alliance for Black School Educators. We are honored for the opportunity to learn from Dr. Fenwick's knowledge and wisdom as she offers a newly excavated history of Brown and how it is still misdefined. Please join me in welcoming the 2023 Brown Lecturer in Education Research speaker, Dr. Leslie T. Fenwick. <laughs> I better have something to say after that. <laughs> Thank you for that extraordinary and warm welcome. I feel deeply honored to deliver the 20th Brown Lecture and especially privileged by your presence here today, this evening. Thank you to my colleagues who are members of the Brown Lecture Selection Committee for affirming and recognizing my research, my most recent book, Jim Crow's Pink Slip and Education Advocacy, Felice, your stalwart leadership continues to expand space for an increasingly diverse set of scholars from all over the world. ARA looks, feels, and sounds very different from when I began attending in 1993, and I think that's a great thing. Tyrone and Rich, AERA's current and past presidents, all I can say is that leadership matters. We are grateful for your vision and abiding commitment to speaking our truths through your research. I'm so pleased that my loving family is here this evening. My dad, Dr. Joseph Fenwick. <laughs> My mom, Mrs. Faye Fenwick, is here with us in spirit. My husband, Howard University President Emeritus H. Patrick Swigert. <laughs> my youngest brother, Dr. Chika Akua, who is on the faculty at Clark Atlanta University, and my sister-in-law, Willette. I have, I have too many friends um, and colleagues here to acknowledge each one, but I must thank these three for their abiding support. Dr. Lynn Gangone, President of the American Association of Colleges for Teacher Education. Um, <laughs> Harvard Editor-in-Chief Jane Fargnoli. And last, but certainly not least, my family of Howard University faculty, staff, and students. And I'll say it again, H-U. <laughs> well, I learned um, the details about the academic rigor, cultural excellence, and strength of segregated African-American schools from these people, my parents. I grew up in very fortunate circumstances with extraordinary parents who taught my four brothers and me the most comprehensive lessons about African-American history, history, ones that we never learned in the private schools we attended. Both of my parents and all of my grandparents attended segregated all African-American schools. 
My mom, among the schools she attended, the stellar Sumner High School in Kansas City, Kansas, and my dad, the famed Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School right here in Washington, D.C. So I grew up hearing stories about their schools as they tauntingly debated who had the best African-American teachers. This is what I'd hear my dad say. My French teacher, you remember this dad? My French teacher graduated from Dunbar High School, then attended and graduated uh, Radcliffe College, cum laude in 1918, and earned her master's degree at the Sorbonne. My mom would respond, and my biology teachers graduated from Howard University and Fisk University and earned PhDs at the University of Chicago and Harvard University. What this means is that my research since 1993 on the African-American principal and teacher pipelines comes from a place of knowing. When I conducted library research, I was seeking to learn more about what I already knew existed and what I knew existed in the African-American community was edifying, it was consequential, it was uplifting, and guess what? It was also true. I titled my lecture this evening, Otherwise Qualified, The Untold Story of Brown and, the, and African-American Educators' Professional Superiority. It's divided into four sections, a theory of cultural elision, the intention of Brown, the myth of African-American professional inferiority and its relationship to the recent affirmative action decision, and three traumas, recommendations for a way forward. Now I'm supposed to do all this in 30 minutes and I don't wanna be yanked off the stage, but if I go over a little, you'll, you'll stick with me. Um, a theory of cultural elision. The history, research, and commentary about African-American people is plagued by what I label the theory of cultural elision. I define the theory of cultural elision as an operative lens leading to the purposeful disregard, unseeing, and incomprehension of anything consequentially positive, self-determinative, or superior about African-Americans. In the telling of history, the conduct of research, and the phrasing of social commentary, application of this operative lens results in valorizing white males and promoting whiteness as normative and positive. To the contrary, as I mentioned before, anything consequentially positive or superlative about African Americans is reflexively left out as if it simply could not be so. If on the odd chance that African-American excellence is acknowledged, it's usually tied to a single African-American who is then exceptionalized in the research and the history and the commentary. In recent years, I saw this theory of cultural elision play out in news stories about US President Barack Obama's appointment to the Harvard Law Review during his days as a student there. News accounts exceptionalized Obama for this achievement to be sure, Obama was the first African-American president of the Harvard Law Review and had served as one of its editors in years prior. However, the telling of his ascension to the review's presidency led many in the press to conclude erroneously that there had been no other African-American male editors to the Harvard Law Review prior to Obama. In fact, the first African-American member of the Harvard Law Review was Charles Hamilton Houston, who served as an editor in 1921. And incidentally, that same year, Jasper Atkins became the first African-American elected to the Yale Law Review as an editor. Houston was a graduate of your high school, Dad, the all African-American Paul Lawrence Dunbar. We've talked about this right here in Washington, DC. He was a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Amherst College, where he was valedictorian of his class, and he earned his law degree cum laude from Harvard in 1923. Houston was followed by two other African-American male editors of the Harvard Law Review, William Henry Hasty, also a Dunbar High School graduate, and William T. Coleman, who served as law review editors in 1930 and 1946, respectively. In the dominant myth histories, African-American principals and teachers who were discarded with African-American schools were inferior and shabby relics of a Jim Crow era. 
But what does it really mean to recognize that these displaced African-American educators were in fact superior in their academic credentials, professional licensure, attitudinal commitment to democratic ideals, consistent activism against the ideology of racism, and experience with integrated society. The focus of my research um, and my most recent book, Jim Crow's Pink Slip, is on the displaced African-American educators' credentials. It is the first book to fully excavate and reclaim this history. I view the focus on credentials as essential because they stand as evidence against the ubiquitous lie of African-American intellectual inferiority. So rather than confirming African-American incapacity, these educators' credentials affirmed their equality and superiority and self-agency. Their credentials affirm their determination not to be stymied by all the odds stacked against them in the Jim Crow South and border states and to maneuver this evil system to their and their communities uplift and advantage. And the story about how they earned these credentials in the late 1800s and the early 1900s is one that flies in the face of traditional narratives about African-American educational attainment, especially prior to 1954. The primary but not exclusive evidentiary base um, for Jim Crow's pink slip is the 1971 U.S. Senate Select Committee hearings on the displacement of black principals. I still wonder why and how the prolific citations of the 1971 Senate hearings, which from beginning to end focused almost exclusively on the exceptional credentials of African-American uh, displaced educators, why they've not been prior subject to presentation in the hundreds of research articles and books and newspaper accounts and other narratives about desegregation. It's as if the segregationist assertion that African-American schools and the professionals who inhabited them have been substantiated without evidence or in fact in direct contradiction to the evidence. So this is the untold story of African-American educators who were powerful models of intellectual authority and who sought, fought for, and gained exceptional academic credentials as part of their personal and communal fight for unfettered equality and full citizenship in American society. Their fight was against a life and future abridged by the ubiquitous insult that they as African-Americans were intellectually or in any other way inferior. This is their story. It is the story of a collective, not an exceptionalized individual, a collective who used education to push against the oppressive arc of race madness and second-class citizenship. The intent of Brown, we're living with histories that we do not know. June 15th, 1971. That was the day that the 1954 Brown decision outlawing racial segregation in public schools was narrowly operationalized as African-American white student ratios, integration busing, and pairing and clustering of schools for racial balance. However, Brown was not intended to simply mean that African-American and white students were to be educated side by side in order to achieve integrated schools. Brown and many legal decisions subsequent to it, especially the Singleton and Bradley decisions, demanded that public schools integrate wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y, meaning that their administrative ranks, superintendents, principals, other district leadership, faculty and student bodies were to be integrated, not just the student bodies. Brown never meant just integrate the student bodies. The failure to integrate school personnel was and remains the unfulfilled promise of Brown. And I believe that many of the inadequacies of our current PK-12 schools are traceable to this failure. As early as 1952, NAACP attorney Thurgood Marshall feared that if Brown was successful, African-American principals and teachers would be, 
forced from their jobs, illegally forced from their jobs as educators, leaving newly desegregating school systems with an all-white educator core. So prior to Brown, Marshall established the NAACP's Teacher Information and Security Department to raise funds to assist African-American educators with litigating cases that would later ensue from their illegal firings, dismissals, and demotion by white segregationist school board members and superintendents in the 17 border and southern states operating racially public schools, racially segregated public schools. Brown also did not mean that all African American segregated schools were to be closed and that all segregated all white schools were to remain open and become the near singular recipient of African American students. But that was what was orchestrated to happen by white segregationists who used state laws and public tax dollars to resist the new law of the land. At the time, racial discrimination in state laws, violence and intimidation, some familiar themes even now, resulted in few African-Americans being registered to vote in the border and southern states, with African-Americans denied their most basic right as citizens in a democracy, the right to vote, whites maintained control over all state and local elected and appointed offices, policy formulation and implementation, and budget allocations and expenditures. And their rush to stop Rather than fulfill Brown's mandate, white elected and appointed officials and political bodies, school boards, superintendents, state legislatures, and governors initiated a massive resistance strategy that supported the firing, dismissal, and demotions of 100,000 African-American principals and teachers from as early as 1952 and well into the late 1970s. Earlier research has put the number of those who were displaced at between 30 and 38,000 educators, but updates to the timeline and available displacement data show far more damage. Prior to Brown in the 17 dual system states, 35 to 50% of principals and teachers were African American. Today, there is no state that approaches these percentages. In fact, as you know, 7% of the nation's 3.2 million teachers, 11% of the nation's 90,000 principals, and less than 3% of the nation's nearly 14,000 superintendents are African American. And the underrepresentation of African Americans in the nation's educator workforce is tied as the history I uncovered to massive resistance to Brown. It's not tied to Brown, it's tied to massive resistance to Brown. Despite the damage to the pipeline, African Americans remain the nation's most academically credentialed educators. As teachers, principals and superintendents, they are more likely than their white peers to hold master's and doctoral degrees and have more years of professional experience when they ascend the ranks of uh, school and district leadership. The myth of black professional inferiority and its relationship to recent affirmative action decisions. In a riveting account shared with the Senate Select Committee, a Georgia educator, Dr. Betty M. Smith, explained to the committee chair, who at the time was Senator Walter Mondale, who goes on to become vice president, why the illegal place displacement of African-American principals constituted a painful and unfair loss of talent to the nation's schools. Like most of her African-American peers, Smith was well-educated with a bachelor's degree from HBCU Tennessee State University and master's and doctoral degrees from New York University. As secretary of the Georgia Council of Secondary School Principals and African American Education Association, Smith told the committee that she had seen the organization's membership dwindle from 190 in 1969 to six in 1970. Dr. Betty Smith wasn't alone. She was in all respects the rule and not the exception. To provide some evidence of this, I direct your attention to this slide that summarizes the names, years of experience, and academic credentials of the presidents of the American Teachers Association, the All African American Teachers Association, for the years specifically 
1900 to 1951. ATA's presidents, as you can see, were an academically credentialed, professionally accomplished, and activist group. They mirrored the distinguished achievements of the organization's rank and file members. And more than half of ATA's presidents who held office between 1910 and 1951, I looked at those years specifically, had earned undergraduate or graduate degrees, some as early as the 1800s, from nationally prominent institutions, including Brown University, Columbia University, Harvard, University of Chicago, University of Pennsylvania, and New York University. And you see some familiar names among those uh, listed. Uh, Mordecai Wyatt Johnson, Howard University, does that name sound familiar? <laughs> Um, Rufus Early Clement, uh, Clark Atlanta University faculty and students, does that name sound familiar? And Mary McLeod Bethune, um, all of us know many of those names. Despite her excellent academic credentials and professional success as a principal, Dr. Betty Smith was summarily fired and replaced by a less qualified white male, all in the name of school desegregation. She was one of 100,000. In the 17 dual system states, African-American people were taxpaying citizens in their home states, but barred by state law from attending their state's public and private colleges and universities for undergraduate, for graduate, and professional school education, all of which were white restricted, though publicly supported with tax dollars. As I document in chapter two of my book, State legislatures created and codified Negro tuition scholarships in, a, in an attempt to skirt the 14th Amendment rights of African American citizens and maintain their segregation, segregationist hold on public colleges and universities. In 1938, Maryland state statute stated, and I'm providing it here for you with some highlights, in 1938, Maryland state statute stated that the Negro tuition scholarship provides scholarships for Negroes otherwise qualified to attend the University of Maryland. That was the exact language of the statute, as you can see highlighted in yellow. Negro tuition scholarships, these segregationist scholarships provided for Negroes otherwise qualified for admission to the University of, of Maryland. And the associated budget ap appropriation language stated that the funds were for instances where the state of Maryland provides opportunities for white students and for which it does not provide opportunities for Negro students. So what did African American people locked out of taxpayer funded public colleges and universities? So African American people and all other people are paying tax dollars, but African American people can't access these institutions. What did they do? They established and attended public and private HBCUs. These institutions are among the nations only that have never had racially exclusive admissions policies. African-American residents desiring to attend graduate and professional schools could only attend HBCUs. But few HBCUs had graduate and professional school programs, most notably Howard University, Atlanta University, Fisk University and Meharry Medical College. If the HBCUs did not have their field of study, African-American students were forced to leave their state of residence to attend an integrated university, usually those located in one of the North, Northeastern or Midwestern states. Negro tuition scholarships were allocated by the state for this purpose, essentially booting citizens out of their home state rather than using state funds to integrate colleges and universities. So generations of African Americans seeking PhDs, MDs, DDSs, JDs, and other graduate and professional schools uh, degrees played by the rules, convoluted, imposing, and insulting as they were, and trekked to the Northeast, the Midwest, and even the Far West to earn master's and doctoral degrees. And as my book discusses African American principals and teachers in the border and southern states, in particular, those who were seeking master's and doctoral degrees overwhelmingly earned them at these nationally preeminent institutions in this order of frequency. New York University, Columbia University, University of Chicago, Harvard University, the University of Michigan, University of Pennsylvania, The Ohio State University, 
and Iowa State University. Between 1930 and 1960, Columbia University alone awarded 144 doctorates to African-American graduates of HBCUs. I call the trek by African-American educators an academic migration because it did not result in an exodus from the border in southern states. After they completed their education, they always returned to their home states and continued serving as principals and teachers in segregated all African-American public schools. And as part of their community leadership, before and after their academic migration, these educators led voting rights campaigns and established NAACP chapters, often at great risk to their own and their family's safety. Despite their superior academic credentials, exceptional leadership as principals and teachers and civic activism, tens of thousands were summarily fired, dismissed, and demoted between 1952 and the late 1970s as backlash to, to Brown. This is the origin of the contemporary underrepresentation of African American educators in the workforce. The origin is not that blacks after Brown pursued other fields and left education, which is the myth that is often repeated in research. That is not the factual or, or, or historical record. U.S. Department of, of Labor Statistics um, don't uh, justify that myth um, and that a historical accounting. This is the origin of the contemporary underrepresentation of black educators in the workforce. And I have a question. Do the justices who wrote the recent Supreme Court decision know or care about this history and its infliction of continuing trauma on African-American citizens' aspirations and delay toward our nation's highest ideals of egalitarian and equal treatment under the law? Do they know or care that in at least 17 states, the state wielded the hand, prohibiting otherwise qualified African-American citizens from admission to undergraduate programs at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, for 171 years of its 234 years of existence. The years that states in University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill isn't alone. This was happening throughout the 17 border and southern states. The years that these states prohibited otherwise qualified African-Americans from attending far outnumber the year, years admissions, ha, admissions have been granted uh, anemically open to African-Americans. These principals and teachers' academic migration made a difference in terms of the quality of all African-American segregated schools as one example of the many, remember these are not exceptionalized uh, examples, as one example of the many, the 1926 roster of Sumner High School faculty indicated that 41% of the all African American faculty held master's degrees, including three from the University of Chicago. By 1935, the percentage had grown to 61% with master's degrees, including three faculty who earned master's degrees from the University of Chicago, two from Columbia University, and one from Harvard. And notably, with the integration of the school's faculty in 1968 to include more white teachers, the percentage of faculty members with a master's degree fell below its 1926 level to 35%. Sumner High School was the school that my, the high school my mom attended, so she was right. The data bear out her assertions. Um, the, the mass closure of African-American schools and influx of African-American students into previously all white segregated schools led to an increased need then for principals and teachers in the desegregating schools. But with African-American principals and teachers illegally pushed out of the school systems, white superintendents and school boards found themselves in a quandary. Who was going to lead and teach the swelling numbers of students? Pressed by the need to hire more educators, they manufactured, they manufactured principal and teacher shortages, 
turning almost exclusively, exclusively to whites outside of the education profession, vacating state requirements for education degrees and teacher licensure and creating fast track tracks into classrooms through emergency certification, manufactured, manufactured, manufactured. In massive resistance to Brown, we find the origins of alternative licensure, emergency uh, uh, certification, and the black male educator shortage. It's not new. It was manufactured. It is unlikely that the generation of African-American principals and teachers who were illegally displaced would trust contemporary school reform models such as vouchers, school choice, and charter schools. After all, these were among the very mechanisms that they experienced during the decades-long stalling of Brown's progress that were used as part of the plan to annihilate their careers. Three enduring traumas and recommendations for a way forward. The annihilation of African-American principals and teachers was traumatic. The first trauma was economic. Before the Brown decision in 1954, nearly half of all black professionals were teachers compared to less than 25% of white professionals. Over time, desegregation left African-American educators nearly one billion, B as in boy, poorer from income loss due to firings, demotions, dismissals, and non-hires. And in fact, the calculation about non-hires is not even complete, certainly not by me. I've started it, but I'm not finished. White hires happened at the economic expense of African-American educators, resulting in white economic gains that continue today. The second trauma was equally distressing, namely the damage done to school systems because of the loss of high caliber leadership. Proven African-American leaders were replaced on a near one-to-one -one basis with whites who held less or no qualifications. The assault on the professional identity and stature of African-American educators ensured that the desegregated school system would be held captive by the same Jim Crow power structure that had fought vehemently against desegregation for decades. The third trauma was the unkindest cut of all. If schooling is about children, as all the sentimental slogans profess, African-American children didn't really seem to count. Pushed into hostile new schools without African-American models of intellectual authority in their teachers, or models of leadership authority in their principals who could serve as guides and protectors, African-American students' socialization and education suffered and continues to suffer. Why are we still struggling to mark real progress in education? Since the arrival of African-American students in previously all-white segregated schools after Brown, Education policies and practices have almost exclusively been informed by white social scientists, psychometricians, educational leaders, local elected officials, philanthropists, and their acolytes. And their acolytes. These individuals have no deep tissue knowledge about African American history, culture, and achievement. And without this essential knowledge, in the face of pervasive negative social commentary and media commentary about blacks, and under the influence of foundational racism in the biological and social sciences that shape education research and psychometrics, white power brokers believed and actively reproduced deficit perspectives about blacks. Their erroneous perspectives made and continue to make I'm just saying. Their way into policies, federal, state, and philanthropic funding streams and intervention programs rarely have any of these mechanisms taken aim at the root causes of disparity, so the disparities remain. And when the disparities remain, and people make 
livelihoods off of disparities remaining. And scholars make livelihood off of disparities remaining and reporting on those disparities. And when they remain, blacks and other communities of color are viewed as beyond intervention. The harm is not just about the decimation of African-American principals and teachers and the subsequent underrepresentation of African-Americans in the nation's educator workforce. That's not the only harm. The harm is about what was amplified with the loss of African-American educators. So now you said all this, Fenwick. <laughs> so what can be done at this point? This is what my dad would say, well, well, well what are you gonna do now? Um, following are four of the nine recommendations um, discussed in Jim Crow's Pink Slip. And many of these recommendations will not sound new to you. I just think we need to animate them. Um, first, tell the history and refute the myth about the underrepresentation of African Americans in the educator workforce. We did not flee. We did not flee the education professions after Brown because there was a cornucopia of experiences waiting for us elsewhere. <laughs> so let's tell the truth and tell the history. Tell the history and refute the myth. Number two, discontinue use of teacher licensure examinations and all other standardized tests that replicate racial disparities until psychometricians can create tests that do not replicate racial disparities. We are in, I have just 30 more seconds, I'm sure I'm over time, but I'm gonna go a little bit off script here. So we're in the second decade of a new millennium Approaching a third decade, um, the, the, the NASA scientists tell us they found what water on one of the moons of Jupiter. We're crafting a course toward Mars. We have self-driving cars. I could go on and on about all the scientific advancements. And yet, psychometricians have yet to create one test that, does, that can show um, intellectual ability, academic achievement, all their tests have racial disparities. And if they have tests that don't have racial disparities, raise your hand if you know one, please. So to my friends who are psychometricians, and at, Ohio, at The Ohio State, I had to take 21 hours of, 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 of statistical research. And so it may be all of us who have PhDs and EDDs or psychometricians, but I won't get into that. But to my friends who are psychometricians, update your science. Everyone else has had to. <laughs> Number three, examine how the transfer of African-American principal and teacher jobs to whites and non-hires of African-American educators affected and continues to affect the black-white wealth gap. And number four of the nine, which I won't go into now, invest in HBCU and Hispanic-serving institutions, HSI, <laughs> teacher, principal, and superintendent preparation programs. If it weren't for these institutions, the nation's goal of having a fully integrated educator workforce wouldn't be achieved. HBCUs prepare about 50% of the nation's teachers, even though they're less than 3% of the nation's colleges and universities, and two HSIs, one in Florida and one in California, prepare 90% of the nation's Latinx teachers. In conclusion, racial equity and educational equity are conjoined goals. It's unlikely that one will be achieved without the other. Whatever progress we may mark as we go forward will be left with unfortunate and aching questions. Had these generations of African-American principals and teachers been integrated into schools after Brown, how might the nation, its schools, and its citizenry have benefited? What could these remarkable professionals and citizens have accomplished with America's schools if they had not been purged? It's difficult, it's very difficult to untangle the damage done from any progress made. What is sure, this is the legacy our public schools and our nation's children live with 
and must overcome. And to conclude, these are the names of some of the 100,000 black principals and teachers whom our nation lost. We owe them more than a debt of gratitude. Thank you for the opportunity to share my research and perspectives and opinions. This is nearly my 40th year in education, and I have a lot to say. Um, the last thing I would say is the music that you heard in the video clip was composed by my nephew, Jabari Akua, who's an engineering student in Georgia, and that's his music that he composed. And. Um, The video clip was done by my other nephew, his brother, Amari Akua, um, and I'm really excited that they both, as very young people, college-aged people, understand and appreciate this story, though it happened uh, well in advance, and their perspectives about the impact on them, um, are, they're really profound to me. So that last little piece of artistry is my little, my not little anymore, nephews. Thank you. Come on, y'all. We can do we can do a little better than that. Let's show Dr. Fenwick. Come on now. Come on now. Thank you. Thank you. Show some love. So uh, do I go have sit a down seat. Now? Have okay. a seat. Take a load off. Um, my great grandmother used to have a saying: "The devil is a lie," mm. and y'all know what that means, right? Uh, Dr. Fenwick, you have really blessed us in powerful ways of helping us to understand the kind of misinformation that has existed about what has happened with black teachers during Brown. We cannot thank you enough for your wisdom, your intellect. And imagine if we didn't have the Leslie Fenwicks. Imagine all the kind of intellectual loss that we would have as a community. So we thank you for what you've done. Thank you for such an insightful and powerful lecture. Um, your knowledge of the challenges facing our nation's schools and school systems and the historical aspects for our broader society service, not only a wake-up call, 
to many, but also as a call to action for all of us, for us as a community of scholars, policymakers, practitioners, and advocates. Uh, we will now move to the discussion portion of the evening. I invite our distinguished discussion forum participants to join Dr. Fenwick on stage on our living room set. <laughs> Come on up, y'all. Come on up. Dr. Fenwick and our moderator and two commentators will examine the relevance mm -hmm. of the issues in her lecture to educators, schools, uh, school practitioners, and policy leaders, and others across the country, and how they connect to contemporary policies, programs, and practices. Our commentators will make brief initial remarks to kick off the conversation, but we highly encourage those of you who are in our in-person as well as our virtual audience to feel very much a part of our dialogue. We encourage you to ask questions and to participate in the conversation. We have microphones on either side for those of you who are attending in person. I am pleased now to introduce our discussion moderator. Nervi Shah is Education Enterprise Editor at USA Today working with the newspaper's National Education Reporting Team and Gannett Education Reporters across the country. She recently spent a year as a Spencer Fellow in the Education Reporting at Columbia University. Prior to that, she spent eight years as an editor and reporter for Politico in the U.S. and Europe. Now I will turn it over to Nervi, who will introduce our two commentators and begin our discussion. Thank you so much for the warm welcome, Dr. Howard, and the insightful and powerful lecture, Dr. Fenwick. I'm so pleased to introduce the other people here on stage, both of whom were teachers in a past life. Dr. Adrian Dorrington is Senior Policy Analyst for the National Education Association, where she oversees federal and state policies related to teacher evaluation and teacher effectiveness. And Eric Duncan is the director for P12 policy at the Education Trust, specializing in policies related to educator quality and increasing the racial diversity of the educator workforce. I would like to ask each of you, just to kick things off, to speak to one of the themes or issues that you found most striking in Dr. Fenwick's remarks, and then we'll have an opportunity for the audience to ask questions. Uh, Dr. Dorrington. Okay, thank you very much. I have been given an almost impossible task this evening to share my opening comments in 180 seconds. So you think you hit a challenge. <laughs> I can envision my colleagues laughing, my colleagues and friends right now laughing, but I think I'm up for this challenge, so let's begin. Thank you very much, AERA, for inviting me to be part of this exhilarating Distinguished Brown Lecture. I am so honored to share the stage here with such dedicated educational scholars. And what an amazing, oh my God, amazing presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Fenwick. I want to address two points that resonated for me tonight from the presentation and also from Dr. Fenwick's paper. And that is the teacher licensure, entrance examination, and the pipeline. So let me begin with the pipeline first. There's an urgent and critical need to diversify the teacher pipeline, especially given the current political climate, and the trauma being experienced by our students, especially students of color. In 2021, the data for public schools, there were 80% white teachers, and there were 7% black teachers. For our administrators, it was 77% white and 10% black. Those percentages are terrible, and they're getting worse because many of our folks are not going into education or quickly leaving it. But why does it matter? Research shows that all students, especially African-American students, benefit from being taught by African-American educators. It's been shown that African-American teachers help to close the achievement gap of African-American students and help to reduce the discipline disparities. Also, research shows black students who have one black teacher by the time of, uh, by their third grade are 7% more likely to graduate from high school and 13% more likely to enroll in college. Just imagine, if you will, of all the possibilities if they had more than one black teacher before grade three. Number two, I want to talk a little bit about the licensure entrance examination that you refer to, Dr. Fenwick. They're often seen as gatekeepers, praxis and praxis-like assessments. And prior to that was a national teacher examination that was first developed in 1940 based on intelligent testing from the 1920s. 
How are these tests constructed? How are the cut scores established? How is equity being addressed? And what about the mounting cost of test taking to the individual student? And last but not least, where are we as African Americans being actively involved in the development of these assessment instruments? Why are these written assessments given so much prominence? We know that performance-based assessments allow the learner to demonstrate their knowledge, skills, and strategies by creating a response or product to real-world situations. In these situations, they must use their higher-order thinking skills, and the assessments allow for a more holistic view of thinking and learning. As I wrap up with my three minutes, which is now gone, but as I wrap up, I want to share an unrelated praxis situation that happened two weeks ago that buttressed Dr. Fenwick's research. Tiffany Kane, my NEA colleague and I, we gathered together 40 plus educators two weeks ago to train them to be praxis coaches because many of our teacher candidates are not being successful and able to pass praxis core and the praxis content. I shared at that time the Brown decision that resulted in the firing of over 100,000 African American educators, many whom were replaced with less qualified white educators, as was noted here this evening. We examined how eugenics, a racially biased, unscientific, immoral theory, purports intelligence to be genetically determined. We speculated how it was likely used in the Brown decision, reinforcing the hiring of white educators perceived to be intellectually superior, and the removal of black teachers and black administrators perceived to be intellectually inferior. It is 2023, 70 years, 7-0, since the Brown decision. And NEA, along with its partners, are still seeking to redress the catastrophic purging of African American educators. We continue to advocate and shape racially and socially just policies and programs that will advance the diversification of the educator workforce. I look forward to continuing this discussion and Ashe. Well, thank you for those great words and I uh, appreciate being here. Uh, uh, and really have always valued uh, Dr. Fenwick uh, since my time at the Department of Education when she and I worked together. Um, so excited to be here and, and represent uh, some of the work that we've done at the Education Trust. Uh, we've really been dedicated to um, uncovering some of the state level policy conditions and policies that uh, both have uh, inhibited the uh, sort of diversification of the educator workforce uh, and what are sort of promising practices uh, that we want to elevate for advocates and policymakers to change their systems to uh, diversify the educator workforce. And I always start with Dr. Fenwick's uh, research and the, the body of work that uh, folks have put out about the ramifications of what happened post Brown v. Board of Education. Uh, and two things really resonated with me, one personally and one uh, based on some of the policy recommendations that we put out uh, in this space. Uh, one, uh, I really appreciated your point about this uh, exceptionalization of uh, individual uh, African Americans at the sort of cost of not elevating the plethora of stories and plethora of role models and folks who um, have done such great work and are great intellects in the, in the space. Um, and I really appreciated your uh, reference around Charles Hamilton Houston. Uh, it, because we have a, a curriculum and uh, instructional materials that are so limited in, in the scope and the way that uh, you know uh, folks are, are taught about our history, uh, Charles Hamilton Houston was somebody that I didn't learn about uh, in depth until I was in college and had a black professor talk to me about him mentoring Thurgood Marshall and the legal strategy around Brown v. Board. Uh, and that is what sort of led me to the career that I pursued because, uh, you know, as uh, somebody who grew up with a single mother and, and didn't have those types of role models, seeing somebody like that uh, have that type of innovative strategy was so impactful. Uh, so just want to highlight how important it is not only to change some of the instructional materials and practices and curriculum that we have in our classrooms now under the attack of so much of this anti-CRT narrative, um, but having those black educators in the space to be able to connect that uh, history, that rich history uh, to this work is so important. And then the second thing uh, from a policy perspective, the 
the alignment of desegregation and the way that we talk about desegregation after Brown uh, that was supposed to happen uh, and not necessarily including the diversification and the desegregation of teachers uh, is so important and it's such a, a crucial link. Uh, you know, we don't have a ton of places now with desegregation orders, but places that have had desegregation orders even more recently uh, have implemented aggressive strategies, court order strategies to increase the diversity of the educator workforce. Uh, and one example that I continually use, even though they're not under desegregation order anymore, but very recently, uh, a parish in Louisiana uh, who was looking to diversify their student population and wanted to add more teachers of color, started at one to two percent uh, of black educators in the parish, uh, had a very simple policy solution and forcing hiring managers and district leaders to justify hiring a white candidate over a qualified black candidate. So just that one practice alone increased the, the, the diversity of the workforce from where it was at one to two percent to most recently 26 percent. And that is just a, a part and parcel of what Dr. Fenwick was talking about, where there's so much of the systems level, uh, the types of policies that have been created to intentionally uh, take teachers of color out of the classroom or black teachers out of the classroom, uh, that even that small solution uh, can have a big impact. So I uh, really appreciate that uh, insight and, and I always enjoy uh, hearing you speak. <laughs> Thank you both so much. Um, Dr. Fenwick, so much of, of what you talked about was a very hard look at our past. And, but, and you did talk about some solutions going forward. And I, I, as a journalist, my instinct is, of course, to take up all of the time to ask all of the questions I have. But I'll, I'm just going to ask one, but just to remind folks that the, the mics are available for you um, to, if you'd like to start uh, gathering to, to ask questions. But I wanted, to, I wanted to look a little bit forward, and this keys off of some of the things that both of you just said, at the building a pipeline and trying to reconstruct something that's been lost for a very, very long time long time. Um, if you all can talk about how to rebuild, not just getting the teachers that are already in degree programs into the classroom, but building the pipeline. There's new research out this week that talked about how students, when they do see someone that looks like them, it can actually encourage them to, to pursue the teaching profession. So, so Dr. Dorrington, or Eric, if you could you know, talk okay, about a little I, bit about that, Dr. Fenwick, of course. I will kick off that. Uh, in terms of the pipeline, the pipeline is crumbling, it is leaking, I'm not even sure if it's going to last much longer given the pipeline that we have. We have very few folks going into education for a wide variety of reasons. Some of them are very valid. And also, I want to another put a pin into this as well. As we talk about this, we also have to consider the cost factor. Our folks are being burdened, they're swamped with student debt as they go into a profession that doesn't pay very well. So it's very difficult to ask people to come into a profession where in some cases they're not being respected, they're not given the resources needed to be successful, and at the same time, they don't have the money to pay the student loan bills as well as maintain a decent standard of living. So those are situations that we have to be, keep front and center as we think about the pipeline. At NEA, in my particular center, which is called the Center for Professional Excellence in Student Learning, we deal with the entire pipeline. We have the education support personnel, uh, the education support department, uh, professional department, and then we have my department, which is teacher quality. So we deal with folks who are interested in coming into the profession from high school into our aspiring educators, what we would call student teachers, into our early career, into our mid-career, and our accomplished teachers. All along the line, we provide technical support, we try to make sure that we have policies that will support the advancement, and we provide, uh, we provide funding and so on in terms of making sure that they have what they need to stay within the profession. Because it's incumbent upon us as, as I think about my retirement and leaving the profession, I want to be able to pass the baton back to someone else to continue on the work that I am so proud to be part of. I, I would add to that this, this concern about financial resources for education students going through programs is really important. And my colleague, uh, uh, Dean Don Williams, will understand this. When I, during my tenure as dean, every year, I looked at the... Um, GPA, 
the median GPA and the median financial need for teacher education students. And I had this assumption that, we, that students were leaving the program, dropping out because of low grades. And what I learned was, I see Dawn, uh, Dean Williams shaking her head, no. What I learned was that the median GPA for our dropouts in teacher ed was like a 3.12, so there's talent there. And the median financial need was $2,500. And that's how I kind of crafted a, 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 an advancement statement to potential donors. $2,500 stood between a talented teacher education um, major, uh, uh, you know, staying in or leaving the profession. As one solution, I'd really like to see scaled up um, federal support and philanthropic support to HBCUs. Yes. I, um, I don't understand the tinkering with organizations, institutions, entities, and nonprofits that have no track record producing black and brown teachers like HBCUs and HSIs. And, um, you know, in poll after poll, American citizens say they value a diverse educator workforce. And so targeting more federal funding at these institutions is important. I was encouraged today, or I think it was yesterday, uh, Lynn, you would know, um, the, US, the, the U.S. Department of Ed announced their uh, diversity in teacher grants and $14 million. And now those are largely with school districts, but that's another step in the right direction. Um, I'm looking at you from your U.S. Department of Ed days. And I also think that we need a public service announcement campaign. 80% of teachers are the first in their family to go to college. Absolutely. And becoming a teacher, despite the depressed uh, salaries, is, is a quick step into a solid middle class, right? But I don't think that many of our young people know the benefits of the profession, that it's a gateway profession. You know, my dad started out as a science teacher in DC public schools later went to dental school, and later became a, a city health commissioner. Uh, you know, I'm a professor. I started out as a fourth grade teacher. My brother's a former middle school teacher. He's a professor. I could go on and on. It's a gateway profession. Um, but we need young people to know that um, there are opportunities in education. But I think what they hear from us and see from us our weary souls. Oh, I don't want to be a teacher. That's the last thing I want to be. Absolutely. Maybe it's the first thing you need to be. I heard it too. Yeah. I heard it too. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, echoing the, the point about investment in HBCUs and, and minority serving institutions, I mean, it's so important. We just talked about this earlier about the Hawkins Center for Excellence uh, finally being funded this year, uh, and that needs to continue. Uh, but I also want to just add to this that, you know, the, the deficit mindsets that you kind of brought up. Um, uh, about educators of color. Um, you know, we have a ton of solutions, I think, that folks have highlighted around, you know, some of the promising practices to uh, bring more of the uh, educators of color into the profession. But I bring this up a lot. Uh, so sorry if you've heard me say this, I'm a broken record. But uh, even the, the base of talent who uh, obtain their licensure uh, requirements, uh, who go through the certification process, uh, there's such a deficit mindset about uh, educators of color and the systems are designed so negatively that there are places where there are a large amount of unhired uh, black and brown educators who are, are, have all of the credentials, have all of the uh, requirements to be teachers and district leaders are still saying we can't hire them, we can't find them, we can't find them. Uh, and there's, you know, a number of examples, but one that I traditionally use is in Connecticut, the state instituted this statewide policy that we uh, like to see about trying to get more educators of color into the profession and, and setting aggressive targets. Uh, and for a number of years, district leaders and hiring managers were saying, we can't find these folks. We don't know where to find them. Uh, and one of the uh, leaders of the uh, state education agency just made a data question, said, you know, what are the numbers of educators of color who have all of these credentials graduated from an institution in our region, but don't have a, a job currently in the classroom? 
and pulled close to 1,000 of these types of educators uh, who did not or weren't placed into uh, uh, schools in the state. And all they did was cold email that group, that uh, the folks who, who they saw in that database, uh, invited them to a job fair, and were able to hire close to 300 educators of color and started to see some incremental increases in the state uh, around diversifying the workforce, which led to further investments. But even something that small, again, I mean, these are not huge, crazy investments or, or policies, uh, but because of the, the deficit mindsets that you brought up and the way that uh, folks aren't valued in that space, I mean, that to me shows how important it is that we, you know, look out uh, and, and interrogate our systems that are, are filtering or supposed to be filtering these educators of color into the profession. It's such an, I just want to say one more thing, because it's such an important point. You know, if you look inside inner city schools, 60% of teachers are white and about a little more than 70% of principals are white in inner city schools. So you have this huge demographic mismatch between the student population and the teachers and principals who are serving them. Many people think that we're reaching and teaching our own, but we're not. Exactly. And even in, in our zeal to diversify the educator pipeline, I don't think any of us is uh, supporting race matching of children. That's not American, it's not democratic. But we are talking about the benefits that accrue to children of color when all of them see diverse models of intellectual authority. White children need to be taught and led by blacks and other groups of people of color. So the, while we're talking about the benefits of this, we're probably not just because of population percentages ever going to achieve you know, equal numbers. We need all groups of people involved, whites, blacks, Asians, Native Americans, all groups of people involved in teaching all the children. Absolutely. Thank you all so much. I see lines forming, so I'd like to let the audience um, ask their questions. If you could start here, please. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Oh, okay. Um, I had, I'm sorry, I had to do a check. I had a question. Um, I wanted to know if there's any suggestions, because I'm coming from Bowie State University. I'm a graduate student, a part of the school psychology program. So I wanted to know, is there anything that I can, you know, apply in my practice as I'm gradually learning and, you know, going for my uh, doc, well, hopefully my doctorate's degree to um, implement those, uh, any suggestions in my practice? Is there any? Can you elaborate? You're going, sure. you're in I know, I'm program? Yeah. yeah, I'm currently in the program. So I'm trying to figure out, is there any like ways that I can incorporate the awareness of like these disparities and, you know, the, in the assessments and, um, you know, discrimination that's seen in schools? How can I um, go against that, you know, and implement them in my future practice as I become a school psychologist? Well, one suggestion no, no, you go ahead. One suggestion that comes to mind, if you're in a master's program, you're likely going to be doing a thesis of some sort. Right. And that's a good place for you to start to investigate some of these disparities in these assessment instruments and using that as a, your project and leapfrog from that or springboard from that into something else. Okay. Bowie State is a great school of education and roles some of the largest uh, Pop, uh, largest number of students in the area, in the DMV area. So congratulations on being a Bowie State University graduate student. Thank you so much. Um, you said you're in psychology, right? Yes, I'm in the school psychology graduate program. So I agree with my colleague here. We need some research about um, the embedded racism in the existing assessments. And we need your generation of uh, psychologists and psychometricians and researchers to create assessments that have no racial disparities. That does not, having racial disparities in assessments should be viewed as passe, wrong-headed, racist and unacceptable. And we need your generation to correct that. So your research, that's where I would start if I were you. I'd love to see you start there. Thank you so much. You know, one of the pieces of history about these licensure exams is that remember all the state reports 
reported that blacks had higher levels of licensure, which meant they passed exams, prior to Brown. After Brown, states, the 17 dual system states, the border all the way up Delaware, all the way down to Florida, over to Texas, contracted with test-making organizations, I'm not naming them, at, to create, or it, to create, to purposely create tests that would continue to constrict blacks' access to, to, to teaching and principalship jobs in the desegregated systems. And the, that history is documented in court cases. So for those of you at, in uh, the School of Law at Howard and elsewhere, American University, go look at those court cases. Go look at those court cases. They are still relevant. And guess what? The disparity percentages are 40 years old. They're the same kinds of disparities. We've, we've narrowed the gender disparities. But I have a question. Where are <laughs> black, I was, I was writing this down while you were talking. What are the tests, I, take all the tests, pick, pick one, and identify, do a thesis on the items on that test where black text, test takers exceed white test takers perform. Let's just begin a conversation there. Do we know? Or are you saying on every item that matters for until 2023, while people are looking at water on Jupiter's moons, that psychometricians can't do better than this? This is unacceptable. This is just unacceptable from an august and scientific body. And if I can just add, I'm sorry. That <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble. These companies make money when you fail and have to retake the test. Yep. That's a, that's a really important That's really important. But I, I have to say, you know, nobody was failing the test until at, the tests before Brown, black principals and teachers were performing mm -hmm. in a superior way. But when an intentionality was attached to the test, things changed. And in Florida, and this is history that's documented directly after Brown, when white test takers failed the new test that was intended to constrict blacks, they dropped the test. They didn't change it, they dropped it. <laughs> so all of this notion that you have to have racial disparities embedded in, in psychometric instruments for them to be valuable or helpful is a personal affront to me as a professional in the field of K-12 and higher ed for 40 years. It's time to stop it. We're looking for water on Mars and you can't come up with a test? All anyone in the room teaching anything related to research, psychometrics, instrument creation, any companies involved in that need to go sit down and talk to themselves and some other people. This is unacceptable. It's just unacceptable. And, and it's hurting children. It's hurting children. It's anti-democratic. It's limiting opportunity. Oh, I'm, I'm going to take my I'm going to take my shot here. <laughs> Let someone else ask a question. Please go ahead. <laughs> yes, um, it's an honor for me to be here today because my two favorite deans are here today. Mm -hmm. Dean Dawn Williams, I was her student when I was a faculty member at Howard, and Dean Fenwick, and this is a gender situation, but I graduated from Howard University four times with a PhD in 76, an MED from the School of Education 50 years ago in 73, and my master's in Spanish in 72, and my BA in 70 with two children. It can be done. And I taught at Dunbar, yes. I taught at the Crimson Tide for 40-something years, and I taught at Howard University, too. So I feel really special to be among all of this intelligentsia and all of that. Now, on the topic of teachers not getting a lot of money, that's not necessarily true. I tell my students going to teaching, it's not how much you earn, but how you invest it. 
Do you buy the cars or do you save the money to travel the world? So I've been to 100 and about six countries and every state. This is true. And I got a lot of that from fellowships that I applied for. On the topic of assessment, I used to score for Princeton, Praxis, SAT, GMAT, GED, and it allowed me to travel to a lot of the United States. And it is true that the testing is really messed up because I wrote some of the tests in Princeton at Chauncey Center. Now my question, at last, yes, is to do with gender. Because I'm concerned, I have two young grandsons, and they go to Gonzaga, but I'm concerned about how they push the black males into sports. You know, I tell my students, this is Uncle Sam, S-A-M, it should be scholastics, then athletics and music or some other field to back up the academics because they always look at, at us as black, uh, and, and us black people as not being able to do anything else except entertainment and sports. And do, I'm at the Kennedy Center more than all of you in here, so do, it's not that. But we must encourage our black males to understand they can do mathematics, for example, and science. Then where are the black male teachers for my grandsons? They aren't there in the primary and secondary levels because the black males can't support children and a family on our salary, they think. Okay, then when we go to the university level, we are also taught the deans are just now showing up, like Dean Williams and Dana Williams and Dean Fenwick. They're just now making females deans. But in the classrooms, where are the male professors? And in the classrooms too, when I teach, if I have 25 students, there'll be three males and 20 something females. I don't know how we're gonna address the student population at the universities and college and high school and secondary level especially where the males seem to fall by the wayside. And then somehow we need an African American presence for males. That's all I have to say. <laughs> And this is, this is for you, Dean Fenwick. I'll give it to your daddy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Which of you would like to take you, you want to take Well, it? yeah, I mean, I'm happy to take it. You know, personally, you know, as the black male on the panel, I think you look at me through those glasses. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I had a personal experience. I taught in the classroom for a number of years. Uh, pay is obviously a, a factor. But I think there are other sort of structural barriers, you know, for me personally and from the research that we've done at Ed Trust, you know, being sort of tapped as the disciplinarian for the black students, having to use planning periods, which I enjoyed at the time, but was stressful at times to bring in the black students that were deemed the, the problems. Uh, at, at the time for me, it was, it was stressful. It was a, a, an added burden and it didn't feel like I was necessarily being valued in that way. Uh, and the research that we've done, you know, basically substantiates that, you know, the, the uh, folks who are tapped into uh, roles where they're not really uh, or pigeonholed into being the disciplinarians or the, uh, you know, gym teachers or the types of roles where their intellect and, and what you kind of brought up are not being really valued. So uh, it, it sort of stifles their ability to, to grow and uh, it grow within that profession. So I think there's a lot to that. Um, but that's just, that's personal for me, you know, and we all have different stories and um, I'm hoping hoping that you continue to encourage your males to, to enter the profession. I think we can't have any of our children uh, feeling that they can only be consumers and commodities. So you know, many, uh, we need more of our children, all, all children engaged in creative efforts you know, to create new science and new art, new music. And, um, but in some communities, there's this kind of focus on, uh, not spoken focus, uh, but this notion that you're to be just a consumer or a commodity for others to make money. And um, 
I think we have to be very attentive to that as adults and, and where we meet and socialize children. Thank you all. Thank you. For our next question, please go ahead. Um, hello, um, my name is William McAlpine. Um, I'm currently student teaching at Boone Elementary or formerly known as Orr Elementary. Um, <laughs> um, my question was, there was a, about the emphasis on the cultural relevance because we kind of discussed how the praxis and a lot of the pre-tests are very culturally relevant and they are kind of holding people out. But I kind of also wanted to expand the discussion about the retention of black educators because of the performance-based assessments they get. Like in DC, they have the impact assessment for teachers and just questioning how culturally reflexive is those impact scores, is those impact tests, and how they want teachers to set up their room. Because I, it seems like it takes a lot of creativity out of a lot of black educators of what they can come to school with, how they can teach the lessons, how they can set up the room to be more culturally relevant to their students. Even as low as, hey, you can't wear that shirt, it has a message on it, but it's not considered professional enough. Or we like that anchor chart, but it doesn't meet the standards of the Eureka math books that we have. How can we make sure that, how can we expand that discussion to make sure those assessments and those, th those observations are more culturally re reflexive for our teachers so they can feel like they can be retained or not feel like they're going to lose their job because they don't get a high enough score? If I could take that question, and I'm not going to speak directly to impact, but I'm going to speak, to, uh, speak more generically to teacher evaluation systems. In terms of teacher evaluation systems, more often than not, what was happening is that the systems were developed devoid or absent of teacher input. Mm. So you have a group of people who have not been in the classroom for maybe years or decades. They were developing these teacher evaluation systems because there was a political agenda behind them. Mm. They have little to do in most cases around teacher effectiveness mm. because it depends on how they're going to define teacher effectiveness. My recommendation with a union background, my recommendation is to work with your union cohort to make sure that there's a collective teacher voice to either push back or make sure that your voice is included in terms of how you make that assessment instrument more teacher friendly and also reflect your voice into, into the construction of that. Because there's many different ways you can use those test results or the feedback from the evaluation system to weed you out of the system and has little to do with your effectiveness in the classroom. Can I ask, since we've talked a lot about the, the testing and, and, it, and its flaws, I mean, is there any kind of movement or emphasis to actually make change? I mean, Dr. Fenwick, you're talking about, you're pleading with this audience to act and, and get these exams either changed or eliminated, but is, that, is there really any force behind that is it, uh, that I, any of you are aware of? I mean, is there any discussion of changing these assessments or eliminating them? or? doing something different altogether. I, I mean, absolutely. You know, uh, there's people in the audience who have uh, been in state education agencies who uh, have instituted policies to uh, invalidate those types of testing mm -hmm. measures. Um, and I, that's happening, I think, in a lot of states across the country. I think what Dr. Fenwick was referring to, though, about the actual tools themselves, I think we still have a lot of work to do to uh, interrogate those and, and bring a, a little bit different of a perspective into the types of testing measures and the, the, uh, the instruments themselves. But from a policy perspective, there are a number of states uh, that have taken this issue on and said, you know, we're not going to use these types of praxis tests or these barriers, licensure barriers, uh, because we know that there are other measures of quality and, and uh, you know, we have a mission to, to uphold that instead of these and often, you know, as Dr. Fenwick brought up, uh, intentionally uh, design measures to, to stop uh, the diversity of the workforce. So, yeah. The, the American Association of Colleges for Teacher Education has a project, the Consortium for, it's CREA, the Consortium for uh, Research on Equity-Based Assessments that tackled this issue with a 14-state consortium around 
uh, teacher licensure exams. And so if members of the audience Google CREA and AACTE, there are a series of monographs uh, that guided that work. And there were some great outcomes when um, partnerships of, of um, institutions of higher ed, K-12 educators, and State Department officials looked at these uh, tests and the cutoff scores and um, decided to either use different assessments or adjust how they were setting cutoff scores, which was oftentimes a more capricious act than a psychometric act. It was like, oh, let's set the test, the, the cutoff here. And in many states, that cutoff was one to three points um, higher than the median score for African-American test takers. But it had a disproportionately negative practical um, impact. And to the young man that asked the question earlier, I would um, ask you to look at uh, Dr. Chika Akua's work, AKUA, on teacher transformation. I think it will be very helpful to you. And the other thing I want to make very clear is that there, we're talking about a wide range of tests. We're talking about the teacher licensure type of, to get into the, into the profession. But what the young gentleman was talking about was the teacher evaluation system here by DC, which allows you to be retained into the profession. So again, we're talking about tests across the board, but there are different types of tests that have different impacts. No pun intended. <laughs> Please go ahead. Dean Fenwick, uh, thank you for dispelling enduring lies about black educators in the US education system in a way that cannot be intelligibly contested. In listening to your talk, I couldn't help but to think about the domino effect of these intentionally nefarious decisions, one of which is the proliferation of disproportionate discipline and special education practices and outcomes for black, specifically African-American students. Dean Fenwick, what are your thoughts on the relationship between the Brown decision, the erasure of black educators, and another pressing issue for our black children in equities and special education? Mm, wow. <laughs> I think this is Dr. Ashley White. Yes. Yep. My sister in the struggle here. Um, I, I don't want to flatten this very important question. Um, but I think that if we did a simple exercise and had, you know, two lines and looked at the proliferate, look, look on the bottom axis, chart the years after integration and really with a push around 1970 and looked at the proliferation of tests and their use to, to um, you know, categorize students. Pro part of the problem with these tests is that once students are in these groups, whether that's special education and includes learning, disabi learning disabilities and other disabilities, they're not malleable. And children, one of the things we know from psychology, I'm talk talking to my Bowie State person over here, one of the things we know from psychology is that children are malleable. The nature of being a child is that you change. So, you know, I, th I think we should look at the years that these tests proliferated, the years that the categories proliferated, the percentage of students. Now, my psychometrician friends are going to say this is maybe anecdotal or maybe it's just, you know, coincidental. It's not, you know, more serious than that, but we know the stories. We know, we know not only the stories, we know the data. We've seen this as teachers. I mean, I know when I was in K-12 schools, I saw how these tests were used to uh, limit children's opportunities. Um, I think we have enough research to say this. And at this juncture, the next generation of scholars, I think their work is to tear down these structures. Mm -hmm. We have all the data that says that they should be torn down. So let's get at that work and maybe report on the effectiveness of that work in our research. Thank you. Uh, another question here, please. 
Yes, um, thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. White, for that important question on special <laughs> education. I'm also, my name is Colin uh, Bird. I'm in the school psychology department at Bowie State University as well. So I'm grateful <laughs> to, to be the second person in my cohort to, to ask a question. And I'm actually in the class. And this is important because I've been reading the room. I'm in the class of Dr. Darla Scott, who earned her PhD from Howard University. <laughs> Okay, so, all right, all right. So with that being said, um, I just wanted to, uh, I got a two-part question. I'm going to try to make it quick. One, um, in my, as I was listening to this, I appreciated how you were talking about Thurgood Marshall and Charles Hamilton Houston, some of these people that were involved in the case of Brown versus Board of Education. And I spent a lot of time researching that case. Um, and one of the things that I'm aware of, particularly given my field, is that there was a lot of social science research that actually went into supporting the plaintiffs in that case. And what's foremost in my mind is actually the first black president of APA, which was Kenneth Clark. He and Kenneth, Kenneth and Mamie Clark, they did the Dahl study, and that was very heavily influential in that case. But prior to that, a lot of people don't know it, it was a black woman who was the first black woman to receive a PhD in psychology named Inez Prosser. And she had done research that actually suggested that there are some benefits psychologically of African-American children going to predominantly black or segregated schools at that time. And so there's this debate that I think sort of indirectly has been going on over time among scholars and just in the general public about basically Brown, right? I've heard people say that they think segregated, like the de desegregation of schools wasn't so great for black uh, people. I've heard people debating to this day, like PWIs versus HBCUs. And I know you went to PWIs, but also taught at HBCU. So I'm just curious where you fall into that debate. Number one, um, just in terms, I, yeah, I know it's controversial, but I just want to know where you fall into that because this is kind of getting there. And then the other thing is a lot of your presentation was about the quantity of black educators. And I want to just get your thoughts on the quality of educators, regardless of race, because there's always going to be some black educators and some white educators. And I'm wondering what you think are the differences between those educators, black or white, that are really effective and those that are not so effective as sort of I have to advise them in my role as a school psychologist on how to be, be better. So just I hope those, those two make sense. So the first question about segregation, um, we live in the United States of America in a democracy, and there should be no citizen in this country whose opportunities and experiences are abridged because of race or any other categorization. Segregation was an abomination of a policy. It was anti-American, and, and we, you know, the Brown decision and our activities going forward are clear about that. So my work is not intended in any way to be some underhanded, <laughs> subtle endorsement of segregated policies. What it is trying to do is to say we lost something. We never acknowledged something, and then we lost it. And the loss was to our detriment. So we misdefined Brown. The segregationist hold on the decision of Brown misdefined it, it polluted it, and it made it only related to black-white student ratios when the decision itself and those subsequent to it said that integration would only be achieved when you integrated everyone, right? The principal, the superintendents, the principals, the teachers. So my work is not intended in any way to suggest that we need to have segregative policies. This is an American democracy. No, we don't. What we need to do is to acknowledge the quality and caliber of the number of individuals we lost. That's okay. So my work isn't a focus on the number. It's a focus on credentials, which stands as a, a framer for the quality of individuals that we lost. And even in modern day research and all the research that we've seen in the last I would say 10 years, the most recent research about academic and social benefits that accrue to African-American and Latinx students when they're in schools with diversely staffed uh, population, uh, teacher populations. 
that work is starting to say that maybe the difference is not just role modeling, that it's the actual credentials of black teachers which happen to be um, higher than white teachers. I think the latest, one of the latest reports began to allude to that. So credentials do typically matter. Mm -hmm. um, they're not the end all and be all, but they are one measure of quality. So that's what I would say to the, to the first, I'm, I'm anti-segregation policies. <laughs> no, we are not to be abridged. Yes, absolutely. And, it, and to your point, it was the response to Brown and putting that into context, the massive resistance, the policies that were put in place, to your point, uh, that continue to resonate to this day. I think that's really important. And I, that wasn't something that was a message to me when I was growing up in school. All of the the massive resistance and all of the ways that policies were shaped in order to, to continually harm some of the, the uh, principles that Brown was trying to, to get after, so. We have time for one more question, so. It's gonna be the best one, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm counting on it. <laughs> um, good evening, everyone. My name is Amber Owens. I'm in my third year uh, EDD program at the Mecca, I mean, Howard University. <laughs> So, kind of two, but I'm gonna make it one because you said it was one and one person. Um, so my first point or question for the panel in general is, has there been any research or are you, any of you aware of any correlation? Because Dr. Fenwick, in your, in your book, you highlight a principal who was demoted into a classroom teacher and then a part-time janitor and things of, those nature, and of that nature. I never, until I, you know, experienced your book through Audible, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> before I experienced it, I didn't, I never thought about the behind the scenes impact, right? I just thought well, now we can go to school with everyone else. So I do appreciate you for opening my eyes to the, to the trauma and the damage that was taking place um, purposefully. But has there been any correlation between the removal of black leadership even to be a teacher in a building into janitorial and other supportive roles in the lack of black students, i.e. also black males, in their desire to um, become teachers or become principals rather than wanting to go straight to the district offices, which you highlight often put the black leadership out of the sight of the public because the principal was often the mayoral figure for what it's worth for a black community. So is there any correlation that once black leadership left the building and, and black mm. students now saw them in servant roles, per se, did that continue to go to today? If that makes sense, I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And then my second question is, I, I have, I'm from Ohio, went to Ohio State, the Ohio State University for undergrad. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, my schools were very heavy on white teachers, like heavy on black students, and what you highlight. But coming to D.C., working in D.C. public and charter schools, I see that there's a lot of black teachers for a lot of black students, for what it's worth, in all the buildings that I've been in. But I'm still finding that black students are not succeeding in the ways that you have shown us they were before Brown. So where's the disconnect that you may find between black students having primarily black faculty, staff, in their buildings and still not reaching benchmarks that their white counterparts came from K-3 K through graduation. A lot to unpack. <laughs> <laughs> One of our great doctoral students. <laughs> <laughs> Outstanding. Outstanding. So, you know, the personnel is one part of the structure, right? Um, and so not only do we need, you know, more diversity in terms of uh, the personnel who come in contact with all students, we need to examine the structure that those personnel exist in. Um, and sometimes we know from the data that in schools serving uh, majority populations of students of color and students who are from families experiencing poverty, that they are less likely, 70% less likely, to have a teacher who's certified in the area that he or she is teaching them. Mm -hmm. 
And so when we look at the population of teachers you're talking about, you've been in schools where you see black students and black teachers, my question would be what percentage of them are certified and, and teaching in their area of certification or have a college major or minor in the area that they are teaching. Uh, remember, this is one of the criticisms after the purging of black educators and the need for more teachers and principals, we, we start this practice of just getting anybody in front of students. And so I wonder, given the data, what percentage of those individuals are credentialed and fully certified. And I think that needs to be explored. And then there's an area of research here about narratives, family narratives, about the fallout from this era. What did that do to the aspirations of younger generations of prospective teachers and principals who saw their you know, mother or father or grandparents uh, fired, dismissed, and demoted. How did that experience deflate or agitate an interest in the profession? And that's an area for research for mm -hmm. young, smart scholars like you. <laughs> <laughs> Conscious scholars. Thank you all so much. Uh, we're running out of time. Um, I, I still have, there's, a, there's been so, so many great questions and such a fabulous discussion. I'd, I'd love for each of you to just take a moment to, to share some closing remarks and thoughts, um, whomever would like to start. Happy to start. Uh, first, just so appreciative of the opportunity to be here and uh, to share the stage with uh, my esteemed colleagues. Uh, just quickly, I encourage folks to uh, visit some of the work that other states and districts have done to diversify the educator workforce and just value the importance of the way that history and the, the past has really shaped these policies and use that to really push and ask those questions of policymakers, decision makers uh, about what are these policies designed to do uh, and how have we sort of gotten to the place where these policies have created outcomes that we have now. Uh, so appreciate all that great history that you provided and it informs our work at Edge Trust um, and look forward to continuing this discussion in the future. I would like to thank AERA for the invitation and I thank you very much for sharing your history and the rich data that you shared tonight, Dr. Fenwick. And you did a marvelous job trying to yes. herd cats here. <laughs> thank you very much. Yes. But I'd like to end it with this. If we truly believe that all students, regardless of zip code, deserve caring, competent, and professional, profession-ready teachers, then we must forge partnerships to promote and advocate for socially just policies to ensure that all students have equitable opportunities to maximize their potential. And the success of our nation is tied to the success of our students. And I leave you with this greeting, the Maasai. The Maasai warriors would say to their fellow uh, folks in the village, Kasarian and Jura, how are the children? Hopefully someday that we will be able to say and respond, Sapate and Jura, our children are fine, our village is fine, our nation is fine. Ashe. Ashe. Um, AERA recently published uh, the handbook on teachers of color and indigenous teachers. And um, in participating in that publication, a, a section editor uh, talking about the role of minority serving institutions, what I learned from my own research is these stories are repeated in different groups with uh, the blocking of, of Asian teachers and, Span and uh, Latinx teachers. There's a common history here that I think that we all should be aware of. And I would just reiterate that uh, this line of uh, history, this line of policy pursuit does not support race matching of children. It supports an American ideal of a plural, children experiencing a pluralistic teaching body, administrative body, because what happens when they experience that? They see that the work of generating knowledge, the work of expressing creativity, um, doesn't <clears throat> belong to just one group of people. All groups of people 
are responsible for generating knowledge, engaging in creative exercises. And I think that's the benefit of the message that we all know is an American message. Once again, that's a hard, hard act to follow. You know, one of the least pleasurable parts of being executive director, maybe we'll have the president come up next year, is to, to close what really opened up with such deep scholarship, Leslie, that has led to a teaching in this room and throughout the world. I, we could not thank you enough. And, and Adrian and Eric, just to add to that conversation, those who brought your own voices in the room. And, and Nervi, we know you, we need also the journalists who are the commentators who take that knowledge and translate it. And, and you were just a, a terrific addition to leading this panel. I suppose I just actually want to say one part of what this stimulated uh, in me, and that is uh, that President uh, Tyrone Howard has designated the theme for the year, the presidential theme, dismantling racial injustice and constructing education possibilities. And what we heard here are many actionable possibilities, things that we, the research community needs to do, the parent community needs to do, the school leaders and, and teachers need to do, and that there's a project before us that I think is doable. So I want to thank you all for coming. For those who are virtually with us, uh, well, you can come to the reception. We wish you could. <laughs> the others of you, we have a wonderful reception. There is a book to sign with messages to Leslie. Please do. And same time next year. Thanks so much.